Hey guys, and welcome to Friday. That means it's, of course, Countdown Day. And one of the fun things that all fans like to do for their fandom is kind of debate what are the quintessential, what are the most important, what are the most standout episodes for their franchise. Of course, in this case, we're talking about Transformers. And today we're going to do a countdown of the top 10 most important G1 episodes. That's going to be our focus in the latest Got Bot Counts Down. Hey one, hey all, welcome back to the channel. I'm your host, your most humble of hosts, Dennis Moulton, a.k.a. Gapot. As always, please like, comment, share, of course, subscribe, and while you're at it, light them up, baby. And hit that notification bell, please. It helps me out a ton. It lets you know when content of all sorts goes up here on the channel. Check out Machinery of Man, the Everything Factor, Transformers, Collectors, NL, the Autobot Family, Transformers vs. G.I. Joe vs. DC Universe vs. Marvel, Autobot City Central, and all of my social media links. All of those are down in the description below. I know it's a mouthful. If you're in a position to help the channel to grow, you can use the donate link. Check us out on Patreon. See what we offer to you through Teespring. Or, of course, hit the join button right here on YouTube. And, of course, all the votes from all across social media have been amassed. This is going to be the list of the most important, most quintessential G1 Transformers episodes. That, like, if you were introducing someone to the series, to the franchise, these are the ones you need to watch, man. Now, to be fair, a caveat here. When we had a story arc that was more than one part, I tended to lump them together because otherwise the ten slots would have been taken up with like part one and part two of a certain story. So I kind of put the arc together as though it was one episode. That allows us to fit a lot more on the list. But of course, before we get to the list, we have to start off with the honorable mentions first. By the way, if I have not previously said so, this is actually my box set of the uh, G1 uh, DVDs, I guess. And I love this. It's the entire series. It's been done a few times. I did review this on the channel. Uh, if you're a fan, you owe it to yourself to have the entire series if you don't already have it. It is fantastic and loaded with extras. At least my copy thereof is. Now, the honorable mentions. So, uh, some really good ones here. Some really good ones. And they came so very close to being on the list. There were all, so many great votes. In the honorable mentions, we have first and foremost, The Rebirth, parts one, two, and three. I really wish that we'd had all five parts to the Rebirth. As a matter of fact, I wish we had just had a proper Season 4. There were so many characters introduced and rushed through, not really given much of a story or uh, a personality, but I think they could have become something really special. I've talked about it before. The Headmasters and the Target Masters could have been something special. We could have introduced Power Masters as well. Uh, the Autobot and Decepticon clones, I think there was a lot of story there that could have been hashed out. And indeed, in Japan, to a degree, it was done better than in North America. But the Rebirth makes it into the honorable mentions, as does the Burden Hardest to Bear, which really sort of uh, kind of brought... Rodimus Prime story arc full circle. Now, I'm not a Rodimus Prime fan, but for those who are, they tend to uh, tout the burden hardest to bear as like his story arc coming full circle, the end of his story arc, so to speak. Starscream's Brigade, uh, really, that was kind of like the start of Bruticus. Uh, Call of the Primitives, where we had a lot of the Autobots and Decepticons work together, especially the Beast ones. And Heavy Metal War, all of those our honorable mentions, all of them great quintessential episodes, but they're not quintessential enough to make the list. So who does? Well, we know, you know what we're going to do. We're going to start off with number 10 first. And at number 10, we have one of my personal favorite episodes. In fact, recently I talked about this episode on Tales from Teletran. It is the Search for Alpha Trion. This is a great episode because it introduces Alpha Trion. It adds a little bit to the uh, relationship between Optimus and Alpha Trion. It introduces all of the, well, not all of, but certainly a bevy of the female Autobots. In fact, for a lot of them, if not all of them, it was the one and only time we saw them, even though they have kind of gotten a cult following over the years. Uh, it's when we learned of the characters of Alita 1, and it's when we learned of... Uh, Greenlight, Lancer, and her whole team, basically. Chromia, and 
their associations with various Autobots. We learned that Optimus Prime had a life and a history on Cybertron before the war, before uh, his life on Earth as the Autobot leader. And the fact that it gives just a glimpse of insight into some of the history is one of the reasons it becomes quintessential. The fact that it gives a glimpse of insight into Optimus's relationship with Alpha Tron, which would prove very important later on, is definitely what solidifies it as quintessential. And for those reasons, it takes the number 10 slot. Number 9 brought us some of the most beloved characters in all of Transformers history, the Dinobots with SOS Dinobots. Now, to be fair, only three of the five that we know and love were introduced here. Slag, Sludge, and Grimlock himself. And at first, it was a little bit rough. As many of us know by now, the Dinobots were pretty, not only unintelligent, but pretty wild and pretty vicious and pretty destructive at first. So much so that Optimus Prime ordered them to be sealed up. Until, of course, the Autobots were in trouble and in Energon chains, I think it was. Whatever do you do? However do you stop the Decepticons who are on the verge of winning? Well, you go and you do uh, something that is desperate times calling for desperate measures, and you free the Dinobots once again. The Dinobots come, they take out the Decepticons, and Optimus Prime says, Hey, you know what? You guys are part of the team. Good on ya! And the Autobots all cheer, and the Dinobots growl their approval, and everyone is happy. Especially us, the fans, because most of us do adore the Dinobots. And for that reason, it takes the number 9 slot. Number 8 had the exact same number of votes as number 9, so you could have put them really in any order. And number 8 is, to me, an episode, if not the episode, that had the most important message of morality in it. It is the Golden Lagoon and this was a story largely focused around uh, Beachcomber and his relationship with nature and how he found this beautiful place and you know the, <clears throat> the Golden Lagoon was there and we learn that you know what the Electrum I think it was called uh, can protect uh, Autobots or Decepticons from blaster fire and basically make them impervious. So it becomes a natural resource that the good guys and the bad guys battle over and they destroy the beautiful nature around it. The lesson is about protecting nature. The lesson is about managing resources. The lesson is about conflict over resources. There's a lot of social commentary in this episode. It is one of the best, most important, most iconic episodes of the entire franchise and for that reason it easily takes the number eight slot. Now number seven is one of those examples where we actually have a three-part story so it could have taken up three slots but I mashed it together here to take up one at the number seven slot. It is the ultimate doom parts one two and three. For those of you unaware the ultimate doom was when Megatron basically wanted to bring Cybertron into Earth's orbit and the plan was to harness the energy of the kind of gravitational pull to recharge Cybertron. Uh, it was a very interesting, ambitious plan, storyline, and it was so much about loyalty. Like, at the end of part one, Optimus has to either choose to, you know, destroy his home world or, like, something like press a pylon into place that was going to bring Cybertron into Earth's orbit. So, like, do you protect Cybertron or do you protect Earth? There was the hypno chips, and Spike kept trying to make sure that his father, uh, you know, was doing the right thing and not working for the Decepticons, but he was hypnotized, so he turned on his own son. And, you know, Dr. Archivell, who had been working with the Decepticons, was very unhappy because, you know, they had total disregard for uh, his interests because he's human. Uh, there was so much here about loyalty with such a giant looming danger. Indeed, it had potential to very much be the ultimate doom until it was discovered. Toward the very end that the Energon aboard uh, Megatron shuttle would be enough to kind of propel Cybertron out of orbit, kind of further off into space, and then Cybertron survives and Earth survives. Yay! And so that's exactly what ends up happening, and the shuttle goes down with Spike saying, I'm so glad because Megatron is gone once and for all. And Optimus is like, I don't know about that. And sh certainly enough, at the very tail end, we see Megatron come back online and he flies away basically from the wreckage of his shuttle, living to fight another day. But this was one of the most kind of epic storylines, biggest storylines, biggest threat that they had done up to that point. And it still stands as a great story and even has been mimicked at times in the movies. Remember what Sentinel Prime was trying to do? 
Just saying, I think there's a lot of inspiration from the ultimate doom. And when one epic story can influence another epic story, well, it has to be pretty epic. And for that reason, it takes the number seven slot. Number six is one of the darkest, most disturbing episodes in all of G1. After all, how can it not be dark and disturbing when you revive Optimus Prime basically as a zombie for your nefarious schemes that the Quintessons did in Dark Awakening? Uh, this story... I mean, a lot of people were very sad, very angry that Optimus Prime had been killed off in the film. And this was a chance to see Optimus again, even if for once in all of his glory. And even Rodimus Prime jumped on it and said, here, have the leadership. Take the Matrix back. Man, he was a terrible leader. And he shoved it back. And Optimus, Optimus said, I don't know. Like, I'm not sure if I should take it. And he was like, no, nah, man, you're Optimus Prime. You're the best. He was like, okay, I guess I'll take it only for the Quintessons to really be angling to get control of the Autobots and the Matrix for themselves. Still, Optimus Prime, true to being Optimus Prime, would eventually be the hero. He would manage to kind of fight against the Quintessons' control. The Matrix would go back to Rodimus, and even Optimus would basically try and fly away as his body was being ravaged and wrecked. It was one last, we thought, kick at the can for Optimus to be the hero that we always knew him to be. For that reason, and because of just how dark this episode is, maybe the darkest of all of G1, it has to take the number six slot. And so here we are at the halfway mark again. And at the halfway mark, we have, to my glee, to my joy, the return of Optimus Prime Parts 1 and 2. We just talk, talked about Dark Awakening. We thought that that was going to be the end of it for Optimus Prime. There was such an outcry. Here's the funny part. Optimus was never supposed to come back. There was such, however, an outcry from fans that they ended up having to bring him back. And they'd done so with the return of Optimus Prime. And you talk about lighting our darkest hour. The hate plague, uh, I think from spores, had spread. And it was so easy to spread from one Autobot to another, Autobot to Decepticon, from one Decepticon to another. And it caused kind of mass chaos and mass violence and mass rage. Whoever was going to be able to stop it, the numbers were dwindling, the forces to combat against it were running out, even Rodimus Prime and Ultra Magnus had succumbed to the hate plague. Ah, but then a Quintesson would work to revive Optimus Prime in all of his glory once and for all. And it would be Optimus Prime who would finally end the hate plague once and for all. Just as Optimus Prime should, because if there was ever a quintessential hero, it would definitely be the Autobot leader. And for that reason, the return of Optimus Prime takes the number five slot. Now, fun fact, here at the number four slot, if we were counting one episode at a time, Everything that we've looked at so far would not be on the list. Only from half of number four here, because number four is a two-part episode again. Only half of number four, and what we have at number three, number two, and number one, would have made up all ten slots. How bad would that have been? Because everything we've looked at so far are all fantastic storylines and episodes. What then is at number four, part one and two, of the key to Vector Sigma? And why is this one quintessential and important? Well, it is one where we sort of establish that, for the most part, the Decepticons have their win, their strength, their supremacy in the skies, and the Autobots tend to have their strength on the roads. And it kind of clicked with all of us that, for the most part, the Autobots, you know, few exceptions, Power Glide, you know, Skyfire... Uh, but for the most part, most of the Autobots are land-based vehicles. And when you stop and think about it, outside of, say, Soundwave and Reflector, most of, and Megatron, most of the Decepticons at that point were aircraft. Interesting. And so we got the introduction of one of the most beloved Decepticon combiners of all time in Part 1, that being the Stunticons. And in Part 2, we got the Aerial Bots. And the Aerial Bots would actually prove really important later on. So this was sort of the, outside of Devastator, this was the introduction in the beginning of more combiner teams. And just in these two episodes, we got 10 brand new characters and two brand new combiners. And it was just a great story. It, 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 it just played out really, really well. And who doesn't like combiners? For that reason, it takes the number four slot.
And at number three, we have what could arguably be the most important story in all of Transformers lore. Not just G1, but the whole thing. It is the five faces of darkness. Parts one, two, three, four, and you guessed it, five. And this time around, following the defeat of Unicron, we don't have the Decepticons as the main antagonists. No, we have the Quintessons as the main antagonists. In fact, the Decepticons are left basically in ruins. And the Quintessons take advantage of that. And they strike a deal with the battered Decepticons. The Quintessons are really looking to, once again, control their creations. And we learned that the Quintessons created the Autobots and Decepticons. The Decepticons were military hardware. The Autobots were consumer goods. And... There's a ton of lore here. Plus, we get some great character development for Blitzwing, who sort of says, this is wrong. This isn't the way it should be. And actually pulls his blaster on Galvatron and gets banished from the Decepticons for it. Like, it was a great story arc for him as well. There's a lot here. Now, even since then, it's been retconned that the Quintessons uh, are, were not the creators, if you go by the whole uh, Primus Unicron creation idea, but that... Somewhere along the line, they came to Cybertron very early days and they manipulated the early life forms, the early Autobots and Decepticons, into thinking that they had been built and created by the Quintessons themselves. There's a ton of lore here. But because it, there's a ton of lore, it means every time something is added, they have to go back to this specific story and sort of retcon it because you can't forget about the Quintessons. They fit in there in creation somewhere along the way. Plus, they're just fantastic antagonists for the lore, for the antagonists, for the character arc of, Blitz, character arc of Blitzwing, and so much more. The Five Faces of Darkness, plus it has a cool story name, has to take the number three slot. Speaking of lore, that brings us to number two. And number two is a very interesting one. It is Wardon. And if you don't know Wardon, basically what ends up happening is the uh, aerial bots go back in time and they meet up with uh, Orion Pax and Ariel, I think is Alita One's name. And... You learn that the Decepticons have just been built, and man, those guys are cool, and they can fly. And Megatron kind of turns on his friend Orion Pax and blasts him, and, you know, Ariel gets taken out. And the Ariel bots take Orion Pax and Ariel to Alpha Trion and say, like, basically fix them. And lo and behold, what happens but Orion Pax is rebuilt into... Optimus Prime. Here's the funny part. You talk about the chicken and the egg. Earlier... We talked about the key to Ve Vector Sigma and how really because of Optimus Prime, the aerial bots got created. But the whole reason Optimus Prime exists is because the aerial bots went back in time. So did the aerial bots kind of create Optimus or did Optimus kind of create the aerial bots? Such deep rooted storytelling there. So much history. And of course, we learn a little bit about Optimus's life and how naive and carefree he was before he became the Autobot leader. For that reason, Wardon has to take the number two slot. And so we come here to a number one, and number one is none other than part one, two, and three of the original miniseries, More Than Meets the Eye. When we start out on Cybertron, you know, it is low on energy. It's a dying planet. And we see a few Cybertronian modes for Jazz and for Bumblebee, for Wheeljack, uh, for Soundwave, the Tetrajets. And it's only part, a few minutes of that first episode that happens there. Even the look of Laserbeak is different. But those character models endured so much that even as recently as Siege, we had homages to a lot of those forms. Just from that one kind of beginning, opening few minutes, we've had homages to so many of those forms. Third-party versions by, I think <clears throat> I think it was Moss Toys, homaged uh, the Bumblebee look of uh, his Cybertronian mode from there. Then we get the story where, of course, they come to Earth uh, looking for energy, and the Decepticons are revived first, and then the Autobots are revived, and the Decepticons get a bunch of energy, and they're ready to leave and go back to Cybertron and conquer it and have all the energy. And Optimus tries to take them out, and in doing so, he crash lands back down, but he's okay and survives because he's Optimus Prime, and the Decepticon ship crashes into the ocean, and now they're all stranded on Earth, at least for now. And so the war will continue. The war will begin and go on. Without more than meets the eye, 
We don't have any more stories. We don't have any more franchise. For that reason, it has to take the number one slot. And there you have it once again, guys. We have looked at 10 to 1 for the most quintessential, most important G1 episodes. If you ever have somebody who's new to Transformers come to you and say, where do you begin? Like, there's so much history here with movies and different series and everything. Show them this, man, and say, this is where you begin. This is where you begin. Here are those most important episodes as voted on by fans of the franchise. Let me know where your favorites fell. I appreciate you guys coming by and giving me some of your extremely valuable time. I do know how important it is to you if you're in a position to help the channel to grow. You can use the donate link, check us out on Patreon, see what we offer to you through Teespring, or of course you can hit the join button right here on YouTube, baby. While you're at it, hit the subscribe button. Don't forget that somehow, some way, each and every single day, man, you do make a difference. And I look forward to the next time that you and I get together to have another visit either in the live streams on Thursday nights at the stop motion premieres or the old fashioned way, baby, right here inside the videos.